My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. A lady in her 60s recently consulted me. She was extremely concerned because she was facing a dilemma and she did not know what to do. Basically, she had been to see her GP and because her cholesterol was found to be a little on the higher side, she was being strongly advised by her GP to take a statin. My patient did not want to take statins. Her argument was that she had never had a problem with her heart, did not have a family history of heart disease, and therefore did not want to take medications that could cause her side effects. Her GP told her that by not taking a statin, she was being irresponsible because her risk of a heart attack or a stroke was going to be much higher on account of her having a higher cholesterol and the statin would reduce this risk. My patient was left very troubled. She wanted to do the right thing, but her GP did not really have the time or patience to discuss her concerns with her. As far as he was concerned, it was either his way or the highway. So she came to see me and said, Dr. Gupta, could you please help me make sense of this? What should I do? Am I being irresponsible? And should I go on statins? Today, I'm going to tell you what I told her. This video is entitled, The Great Medication Lottery. All health conditions have to either impact your quality of life adversely or predispose you to some kind of future risk, i.e. impact your length of life adversely. Otherwise, it's not a medical condition at all. High cholesterol is not really a condition unless it impacts on the patient's quality of life or length of life. And therefore, all treatments that are offered have to either improve quality of life or reduce future risk and improve length of life. One important difference between quality of life and quantity of life is that your quality of life can be measured and only be measured by you and your yardstick. No one else can measure your quality of life like you can. Quantity of life, on the other hand, cannot be measured by you. Only other people can measure your quantity of life because to measure something it has to come to an end. Deciding on taking medications that improve quality of life is easy because you can measure your quality of life and therefore if you take a medication that is given to you to improve your quality of life and it does, then you know it's worth taking. If it doesn't, then there is absolutely no need to take it. Deciding on medications that are supposed to improve your length of life is far more difficult because you will never know whether the medication has made you live longer. You could take it all your life and you may think it has, but you will never know for sure because you don't know for sure as to what would have happened if you did not take the medication. So how do you make the decision to take something for the rest of your life when you will never know if it will help or not. The only way to gauge if it is worth taking is if it has helped other people like you. And more importantly, you want to know if it has helped a population of patients just like you. This is where data from research studies can help. What you want to know is, have there been any studies which have studied a large enough population, the larger the better, of patients just like me for a long enough duration, the longer the better, and compared the effect of taking the medications with a similar population who are given placebo. And you want to know how many patients in that population that was taking the medications outlive all of the other population that was not taking the medications by the end of the study period. And based on that number, you can decide whether it is worth you taking the medications or not. When we look at studies that test the impact of a medication on longevity, you will never see that every single person taking the medications will outlive every single person not taking the medications. What we will always see is that bad things happen in both groups, and the chances of bad things happening in both groups will increase with time. It's just that more bad things happen in the group that are taking the less effective therapy. So the more effective the medication, the larger number of people standing alive and well at the end of the study 
compared to the group that has the less effective medication or placebo. So by calculating the difference in the number of people alive and well in both groups, we can work out how effective that medication is. This is called the number needed to treat, NNT. Let me give you an example. We have a study which studies the benefit of medication A, which is supposed to prevent heart attack related deaths. And we want to compare that to placebo. So we take 100 people and give them medication A for five years. We then take 100 identical people, almost identical people, and give them a placebo for five years. At the end of five years, we find that 10 people in the group taking the medication, medication A, have had a heart attack related death. On the other hand, 20 people in the group taking the placebo have had a heart attack related death. We can therefore conclude that 10 people would have had a heart attack related death regardless of whether they took the medications or not, and 80 people would have lived regardless of the medications. But it does appear that the medication did make, did make a difference to 10 people who may have otherwise died if it were not for the medication, because the difference was 10. So in essence, we would have to treat 100 people for five years in order to save 10 lives, which means that we would have to treat 10 people for five years to potentially save one heart attack related death. Hence, the number needed to treat is 10, and that is over five years of treatment. The lower the number needed to treat, the lower the NNT, the more effective the medication. In the same way, medications may also have harmful side effects, and therefore it is possible using the same method to calculate a number needed to harm, NNH. The lower the NNH, the more harmful the medication. As every medication that is supposed to prolong life or reduce future risk should have been studied in a quantitative study, you would be forgiven for thinking that there should be a number needed to treat and a number needed to harm easily available to us to make a judgment on whether we feel that that medication is worth taking or not. Unfortunately, these numbers are incredibly difficult to find. The reason for this is often the numbers needed to treat tend to be underwhelming and to try and push their products, pharmaceutical companies rely on clever statistics and on relative percentages to make their product more appealing. Now, let me explain. If I treat 10 people with a drug and eight are alive at the end of one year, but in a placebo group only six are alive, then we could say that the number of deaths has been reduced by 50% by the medication, although we have only saved two people. Here, the number needed to treat is low, i.e. five, this suggests that this was a very effective medication. Now, if we treat a thousand people with a drug for one year and 998 people are alive at the end of one year in the medication group and only 996 people are alive in the placebo group, then the pharmaceutical company can still claim that the number of deaths has been reduced by 50%, although this time you've had to treat a thousand patients to save two lives. And here, the NNT is much higher. It's 500 instead of 5. This suggests that the medication is not particularly effective at all. So when you get prescribed a medication and you even dare ask the doctor what the benefits are, at most you will be given a relative percentage reduction, such as it will reduce your risk of a heart attack by 30% which sounds impressive, but is actually very far from the correct picture because, because it does not tell you how many people you have had to treat to get that benefit. The problem, of course, with treating lots of people is that they're going to have to take the medications unnecessarily and they're going to be, the sub they're going to be subject to possible harm from the medications and therefore they also have an exceptionally low chance of benefiting from the medications. So we can use a lottery analogy here. If someone comes to sell you a lottery ticket which offers a million pounds as a prize, there are two questions that you should always ask. One, how much is the ticket, i.e. how much discomfort do I have to go through to get a chance at winning the prize? 
but more importantly, how many tickets are going to be sold. If there are only 10 tickets being sold, then I would be tempted to buy the ticket, even if it's a lot more expensive. On the other hand, if a million tickets are going to be sold, then there is little merit in me investing, especially if the expense of the ticket is going to make me uncomfortable. Unfortunately, the pharmaceutical company's response to the question, how many people bought the ticket is, don't worry about that. The more important point is that if you buy two tickets, you will double your chances of winning. Yes and no. If 10 people are buying the ticket, then buying two tickets does meaningfully increase my chance of winning the lottery. But if a million tickets are being sold, then buying two tickets is not really going to increase my chances of winning. All doctors who prescribe medications that are supposed to improve longevity should have the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm for the medications that they're prescribing at their fingertips. Unfortunately, hardly anyone does. And I can say this with confidence because even I don't. And the real reason is that these numbers tend to be hidden away from the public eye and relative risk reduction percentages tend to be promoted everywhere. This just goes to highlight the absurdity of modern day medical practice, which is doctors prescribe medications to patients to promote longevity and neither the doctor nor the patient even knows what the perceived benefit is likely to be. And therefore you just end up taking medications without any good reason. Using the lottery analogy, in this situation, the lottery seller cannot tell you the cost of the ticket or what your chances of winning are based on how many tickets are sold for a prize which you won't know anything about even if you did win. Next time you are with your doctor and he recommends a statin, ask him or her what the NNT and NNH are and I guarantee they won't know. You will get an answer like it will lower your cholesterol and high cholesterol is bad for us. The reality is that you are not taking a cholesterol lowering agent to lower the cholesterol. You are taking it because you don't want to have a heart attack or a stroke. And therefore, just being told that it will lower your cholesterol and this is good for us is not an adequate explanation. You want to know how many people like you would need to take a statin to save one person from having a heart attack or stroke, i.e. the NNT for a heart attack or a stroke. And you will be unpleasantly surprised because your doctor will not know this value. Because the NNTs are so difficult to find, I use a website called www.thenntcom. The On this website, a bunch of statisticians and researchers try and work out the NNT for commonly used interventions. And I would encourage everyone who's contemplating a potentially life prolonging medication to check it out. Here are some examples of NNTs that I have taken from the website. Number one, aspirin. So aspirin, you know, some people say aspirin can prevent heart attacks or strokes. So when you look at the data, if you take aspirin for one year to prevent a first heart attack or stroke, which causes death, you will be wasting your energy because there is no benefit. If you took aspirin to prevent a first non-fatal heart attack, the NNT is 2,000. You would have to treat 2,000 people for a year to prevent one non-fatal first heart attack. What about stroke? The NNT there is 3,000. You would have to take three. You would have to treat 3,000 people for one year with aspirin to prevent a first non-fatal stroke. What about harm from aspirin? Well, the number needed to harm is 3,333. So if you gave 3,333 people aspirin for a year, one person would have a major bleed as a cause, as, as a consequence. What about with my lady, statins? Statins for five years to prevent a first heart attack causing death there is no benefit, okay? So if you took a statin for five years, taking that does not, has not, as far as data go at this point in time, does not prevent a first heart attack which would cause you to die. What about preventing a first non-fatal heart attack? 
the NNT is 104 for five years. So you would have to treat 104 people for five years to prevent one first non-fatal heart attack. What about strokes? The number needed to treat to prevent a first non-fatal stroke is 154. What about number needed to harm? Statins for five years uh, have a number needed to harm of 10 to cause, and in terms of harm, I mean muscle pains, muscle damage. So you treat 10 people for five years and one person will therefore complain of significant muscle problems as a consequence of taking the statins. Uh, what about something which is non-pharmaceutical, like a Mediterranean diet? Well, the number needed to treat to prevent death with a Mediterranean diet is only 30. So you would only have 30 people go on a Mediterranean diet, and as a consequence, you would prevent one death. What about harm from a Mediterranean diet? No harm. So as you can see, the NNTs for medications are in general underwhelming. My patients, uh, the lady who came to see me, seemed a lot more comfortable after our discussion. She finally decided that she was going to decline the statin and adopt a Mediterranean diet. And she has done this and she's very happy with that decision. My aim in this video is not to say that medications are not beneficial. My aim is to empower you to ask questions and be as well informed as possible so that you can make the decisions that are right for you. Please do not make any changes to your medication regime, however, without consulting your own doctor first because they're likely to know you a lot more than I do. I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear your thoughts. And once again, thank you so much for all your kind words and support.